seen in the leptomeninges, but is actually not uh, seen in all cases. And there are pitfalls for both on MR imaging, and I'll try to show some of those to you. For example, here's a flare scan. Now, this is one of the difficulties in imaging is patients with bilateral and symmetric disease. You'll notice that there is suppression in a sulcus here, but not here, not here, not here, not here. How can I be sure that this flare is abnormal? One thing I find helpful is to look at the T2 weighted scan, but not in its usual display, but in a reversed view, which can be done if you're using PACS, is you reverse the imaging. It's one of the options, usually in the PACS menu, invert image or something of the like. This will tell you on the T2 weighted scan which sulci have CSF within them. So for example, this sulcus, you can see the vessel here, is black on the reverse T2 scan. It should be black on the flare scan. It is not. So on that basis, you know, again, look at this sulcus, look at this sulcus. On that basis, you can say that this is an abnormal flare scan and that this is, would be entirely compatible with the diagnosis of meningitis. Now, here's a patient, it looks like the flare scan is abnormal. We see very few cortical sulci bilaterally. It looks like there's a little blurring of the CSF in the interpeduncular cistern and pentagonal cistern. Uh, this was a pediatric case, I believe, and was going on to a spinal tap. Anyway, the spinal tap is normal. Now, how can I explain that? One of the pitfalls in flare imaging is in patients who have receiving oxygen, supplemental oxygen during uh, or immediately before their MR scan. It's a little bit of a stretch of our imagination, but it is true that oxygen alone in high concentrations can alter the relaxation time of CSF sufficiently that it does not suppress on the flare scan. So when you see patients who have this diffuse pattern of abnormal signal on flare imaging, you want to ask the question, is, is the patient under general anesthesia? Uh, in those cases, I think the most you can say is that uh, if the question is whether there's meningitis, you have to say you're not sure because oxygen alone can give this effect. It does not suppress the signal in the ventricles as is true also with meningitis. So this is a pitfall of imaging and you should be aware of it. This pattern of involvement, there's no doubt that these cortical sulci are abnormal in this patient. You see normal suppression in the sulci here and here and here and here. No suppression in these. In fact, these sulci are bright. So, of course, this is an abnormal flare scan. Now, does that mean the patient has meningitis? This patient actually, this flare scan was obtained post-contrast. And post-contrast flare imaging, while helpful in some circumstances, for example, when you're looking for metastatic lesions can be helpful. In this patient who actually has a meningioma, you can be fooled on the flare scan by the presence of gadolinium in the subarachnoid space. Because we know that anything that alters the relaxation time of CSF will cause it to be uh, unsuppressed on normal flare imaging. So the things that will alter its relaxation time are pus in the case of meningitis or increased white cells. Uh, certainly subarachnoid hemorrhage will give you this effect, but gadolinium within the subarachnoid space will also give you this effect. Uh, this was a report we had actually from 20 years ago. We saw this in a patient where on this flare scan, there was unsuppressed sulci here. Uh, we ended up doing some animal studies. This is actually the patient two weeks later. You can see the brain looks normal on a similar level. This was a recognition of gadolinia in the subarachnoid space. There have been numerous reports of this in the meantime. You can see this symmetric pattern of involvement in patients with renal disease where they receive contrast on, say, Monday and they get imaged on Wednesday. The flare scan looks abnormal because of the presence of gadolinium in the subarachnoid space. Uh, more recently, this was in 2001, but more recently people have reported it in patients with normal renal function. So you should be aware of the possibility in patients who have post-gadolinium flare imaging, 
even if the flare scan was obtained a day after or so the administration of contrast, you can see gadolini in the subarachnoid space. Uh, uh, this can also actually be uh, uh, influenced by the presence of uh, contrast after myelography. So be aware of this when you see bilateral involvement. Here's another paper. This is from 2018, again, talking about accumulation of gadolinium in CSF. Now, in this case, you see there's actually uh, abnormal signal in the sulci and in the cortex uh, here with no enhancement. Uh, this patient had fever, confusion, abnormal spinal tap. This is an appearance that would suggest meningitis with encephalitis with the involvement of the brain. So again, the flare scan is very helpful in making the diagnosis, the enhanced scan, not so much. Here's the patient with unresponsive, again, diffuse pattern of abnormal signal in the cortical sulci on the flare scan. You have to be aware that the cortical sulci should be dark. Here you see in the inner pedunculate cistern, there's high signal intensity. There's also edema around the ventricles, which appear dilated. This presumably is from the reflection of a patient with a, probably an extensive meningitis with impaired resorption of CSF at the arachnoid granulation caused by the pus and protein in the subarachnoid space uh, with uh, resulting communicating hydrocephalus. Again, in the medial occipital lobes, notice the high signal intensity in the cortical sulci. So these are all typical findings in patients with meningitis. I've showed you some subtle meningitis. This is more extensive involvement. Here's another case of meningitis. Again, diffuse lack of suppression of CSF here along the sylvian fissure, cortical sulci. Notice that the ventricles stay dark even in meningitis. <coughs> this is <coughs> instructive because it reminds us that the ventricles are actually upstream and the cortical sulci are downstream in the pattern of drainage of CSF. And so uh, you would expect them to look different on flare imaging. Now, this patient has extensive abnormal enhancement here in the ambient cisterns and the interpenuncular cistern and basilar cisterns. So this is a, a case of probably a bacterial meningitis uh, or even could be uh, um, a uh, TB meningitis with this basilar involvement. But uh, these are typical uh, findings in meningitis. I want to show you this case just to make a point. This is a young patient was brought to the ER, comatose after a febrile illness. Of course, you should be thinking of, uh, of meningococcal meningitis in a patient like this. Uh, you get a call if you're a radiologist, they want to get an emergency MR scan before they start uh, uh, antibiotics because they think there may be meningitis. And maybe they're worried that the spinal tap will alter the pattern of enhancement which some people think is true, but I think probably not. Should you rush to arrange the scan, the correct, I think, clinical response in this scenario is to say, don't rush with the MR scan, start antibiotics. Uh, because the MR scan should not uh, be critical to making that diagnosis because the MR scan can be normal even if the patient has meningitis. And my, and my experience is that if the protein, this, the CSF protein is under 100, it is possible for the flare scan to be normal, even when the patient has meningitis. So I do not believe the MR scan is a critical turning point in the algorithm about treatment. Don't rely on the flare scan uh, uh, because you can decide the CSF sampling is really uh, the most important step in establishing the diagnosis. Here you, again, uh, this is a patient who has, uh, this is the T2 weighted scan. Here's the flare scan. Uh, here's, this patient has meningococcal meningitis. Now, what's the finding here? Loss of these cortical sulci. Very subtle finding. There's no communicating hydrocephalus. We still see suppression in the sylvian fissure. It's the subtle loss of sulci around the occipital lobes, which makes the diagnosis. You should be able to recognize this, but I want to point out to you how very subtle the finding can be in some cases and why you should not rely on the MR imaging alone to make the diagnosis of meningitis. So we've talked about 
medial temporal involvement with viral infection and limbic encephalitis. We talked a little bit about the flare imaging and the possibility of seeing some abnormal enhancement with meningitis. Now let's talk about brain abscess, specific collections of pus in the brain from an abscess. Remember that the natural history of the brain abscess is that this usually starts as an area of encephalitis, which then goes on to uh, 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 liquefaction and formation of a capsule, which enhances common bacterial uh, abscess agent is strep. Look for sinus or dental disease, but many brain abscesses go unexplained. The diffusion scan is critical <clears throat> in the diagnosis and is usually diagnostic. Uh, remember that the daughter abscesses or complex contours can be expected and actually can be confusing if you're expecting to see round, well-formed abscesses. Here's a patient with new headaches and left-sided weakness. You can see this edema in the right hemisphere, loss of sort of the appearance of the cortex in this location. Here's the MR scan, ring-enhancing lesion. Now, prior to the availability of diffusion imaging. When you see a case uh, like this, your differential should include brain abscess, metastatic disease, and high-grade glial tumor. But in this case, where we have a diffusion-weighted scan, you'll notice that there's high signal intensity on the diffusion-weighted imaging that shows relatively homogeneous low signal intensity on the ADC map. You should look at these together. Brain abscesses should have quite low signal intensity on the ADC map, which is what leads you to the diagnosis of restricted diffusion. Again, not all things with restricted diffusion are abscesses. Some metastatic lesions and some glial tumors, as well as lymphoma can have restricted diffusion, but it should make you put brain abscess pretty much at the top of your list. And so the, the clinical approach should be to biopsy sooner than later if brain abscess is a consideration. So this is a classic appearance of a brain abscess. Here's another patient, quite a bit of vasogenic edema, mass effect with loss of cortical sulci, some vision symptoms, complex rim-enhancing lesion with this sort of wedge-shaped almost septation that comes through the collection. Does that tell you whether this is an abscess or a tumor? Not at all. Here's the diffusion-weighted scan, restricted diffusion that conforms to that same odd shape that we saw on the post-contrast imaging. Here it is on the ADC map with restricted diffusion, much lower signal than the rest of the brain. This is another brain abscess. And if I could be more specific, these are typical appearances of bacterial brain abscesses. You should be aware that the atypical abscess, uh, atypical organisms like toxoplasmosis, aspergillus may not have this appearance. This was a 35-year-old, had his first seizure, came in, had this appearance, looks for all the world, like on the flare scan, like a brain tumor. Here's the enhanced scan, partial rim enhancement with some edema. The patient went on to biopsy. This proved to be a brain uh, abscess. Uh, and so here's another case, actually very similar to appearance to, uh, to this case. This is a, I'm sorry, this is a report in the role of spectroscopy with these some atypical agents. And this was, the, uh, uh, this was the approach at one time, although MR spectroscopy is being done much less. Here's a patient uh, presents with this CT scan to the emergency room. Uh, you can see there's edema, there's obstruction of the ventricle with dilation. Looks again, your first reaction might be to consider brain uh, tumor. There's a calcification of the brain, which should tip you off. In this case, this is the way the MR scan looked. There was rim enhancement of the lesion. There was actually complete suppression of the contents of this collection on the diffusion weighted imaging. This was perfusion imaging we did. Uh, there was really no, uh, very difficult to read a perfusion in these cases. Uh, uh, with, without uh, surgery and follow-up, this collapsed. This was a case of sister sarcosis. 
So a different sort of brain infection. When you see cystic lesions, uh, either in the ventricles or in the brain parenchyma, particularly with that history of travel in the Southwest or Mexico, uh, you might want to consider the possibility of cystic cirrhosis. Ordinarily, that you'll see some enhancement of the, uh, the rim, a portion of the rim in these cases. Uh, so again, you want to consider atypical infections as well. Another kind of unusual location for a brain abscess, but this was a thalamic rim enhancing lesion. Here you see uh, on the uh, diffusion weighted imaging, this marked restricted diffusion centrally. So again, I'm just showing you a variety of these lesions to sort of emphasize for you uh, how much these tumors will, uh, these lesions uh, with infection and brain abscess can resemble tumors uh, if you're not uh, sort of open to the idea of infection. This was a CT scan. I think impossible to make the diagnosis of this. I mean, certainly, could there be a tumor here? Absolutely. But on the MR scan, rim enhancement with this kind of odd mitten-shaped contour, enhancement of the rim, central restricted diffusion that conforms exactly to the shape of the capsule. So this is all pus in this lesion. And so this is another variation in a bacterial brain abscess. So bacterial abscess, uh, I would say, are always bright on diffusion uh, and look for the restricted diffusion on the ADC map. But not everything that's bright on diffusion is an abscess. Uh, some cases of glioblastoma, some meningiomas, and some metastatic lesions can show restricted diffusion. Those are usually more irregular uh, than the cases I've shown you where it's more homogeneous and conforms exactly to the contour of the enhancing rim. And atypical infections, particularly toxo and aspergillus and, and sister cirrhosis, may not have restricted diffusion. So you still can have brain infection without restricted diffusion. For example, in this case, you can see this lesion. Here it is on the flare scan. It looks bright on the diffusion weighted scan. Doesn't really look like a cyst here on the flare scan. Notice this kind of irregular central enhancement. Could this be an abscess? You should be thinking not typical, right? This is not the typical appearance of a brain abscess. This turned out to be a bright metastatic lesion. Notice that there's actually another lesion over here, which, so again, uh, look at all the scans, but be aware that not everything with restricted diffusion uh, is an abscess. It's, it's, it's curious if you look in the literature that the early articles about diffusion imaging sort of indicated uh, this uh, feeling that there was, this was pathognomonic of abscess, but then the report started to trickle out of other things that had restricted diffusion. Here's another case that shows restricted diffusion here, looks broadly dural base, homogeneous enhancement, not rim enhancement. This is a meningioma. So again, looks kind of like, a, uh, like an extra axial, like an, uh, maybe a subdural abscess on the diffusion scan, but the enhanced scan should make the diagnosis. Now here's an irregular rim enhancing lesion in a 47 year old. Notice on the diffusion scan that the restricted area diffusion does not conform to the capsule or the rim of enhancement. This looks like an abscess, but this is a glioblastoma. Now again, are you gonna see this every day in your practice where you lose faith in the diffusion scan? No, I'm showing you sort of collected uh, cases over a long period of time, but I want you to be aware of this so that you don't uh, come down with complete uh, confidence in these cases with restricted diffusion and rim enhancement that these are abscesses. Here's another case, two rim enhancing lesions you see that this uh, uh, on diffusion is not centrally restricted, it's peripherally restricted. And this was a case of toxoabscesses. Now again, these patients are usually immune compromised so that you should be uh, considering that uh, history when you're looking at differentials. Uh, and uh, this is another, uh, this is uh, more of that case with toxoabscesses. Now, here's this is a normal variant. Uh, here it looks like in this patient with headaches and fever, you see this restricted diffusion in the region of the glomus. Uh, 
this is actually a normal appearance that you can see. It's usually bilateral, but not in every case. And uh, this was uh, shown by Dr. Navavizida, uh, I think a week or so ago in his normal variant talk that you can see, by the way, on YouTube. Uh, it's a recorded uh, lecture. If you go to Rad Physics uh, Quarantine University, you can see that lecture there. And this is a normal variant appearance, a probably uh, reflection of a what is called generally a xanthogranuloma, but basically degenerative change of the choroid plexus. This is not a pathologic finding. Usually in these cases, you'll find that the contralateral choroid plexus is calcified, the reason why it doesn't have that look. So let's look a little bit in uh, remaining time about uh, pus in other spaces. Uh, be alert for abnormal restricted diffusion in the ventricle and extraaxial space. So in this case where you might think this is an artifact on the diffusion scan, we know that because diffusion imaging is done using echo planar techniques that susceptibility effects at the periphery of the brain are common, but you'll notice it's asymmetric with the other side and there is abnormal high signal intensity along the faults. Now you notice how boxy the image looks uh, on uh, this in sort of enlarged view of diffusion. Remember that diffusion imaging is done with a very coarse matrix because uh, we don't have time to acquire a lot of phase encoding steps. And so this is kind of typical for diffusion imaging to have that kind of blurry look. This is a patient with a subdural empyema. This is an important diagnosis to make. Untreated, this uh, has a uh, relatively high mortality. And so this is an, a very important diagnosis to make, this uh, presence of extra axial pus. Different patient, here you see on the T2 weighted scan, there's some hemispheric mass effect, some abnormal signal here. You notice the cortical cell size suppress here on the flare scan not so much over here. It looks like there's an extra axial mass lesion over here. This is what the diffusion scan looked like. Notice in that extra axial space, there are pockets of restricted diffusion here, here, and here, extending into the brain here. You'll also notice a little restricted diffusion up here. So of course I showed you a, a restricted meningioma. This is not a, a meningioma because of the compartmental involvement. This is an epidural abscess, probably from a sin bacterial sinusitis. So again, very important to make this diagnosis. This usually requires urgent neurosurgery to drain these collections because they may not be uh, uh, easily responsive to antibiotics. Here's a patient with uh, sinusitis. I want you to notice that there's some abnormal uh, signal over here. Uh, so this is another manifestation of sinusitis abscesses in other compartments. Now here's a patient with meningitis. Notice the lack of suppression of the cortical sulci. There's a lot of interstitial edema around the ventricles but I want you to notice in the dependent portion of the third ventricle, there's restricted diffusion. You see here and here. So this is an indication of pus within the ventricles. Now, is this a manifestation of ventriculitis? In this case, probably so, from the restricted diffusion here around the ventricles, uh, and, uh, and, but not in every case. I have seen in some cases of simple meningitis, occasionally you'll have some elements of pus that refluxes into the ventricles. Although my impression is that the patients who have restricted uh, diffusion in the ventricles have a, a worse prognosis. Now this is ventriculitis. This patient has this diffuse enhancement of the ependema around the ventricles. Uh, this, is a, this is ventriculitis. So look for these changes. This is what I mean by pus that may reflux into the ventricles. Uh, and here you see a little bit of pus in, in the dependent portion of the uh, sylvian fissure. Pa patient, of course, laying with the back of their head on the table. So you wanna look for uh, these changes on the flare scan and the diffusion 
look in the extraaxial compartment. It could be in the subdural space. It could be in the epidural space. It can be in both spaces. And look into the ventricles uh, for abnormal restricted diffusion uh, on the diffusion weighted scan. Atypical infections uh, uh, may have uh, 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 typical imaging features. Now, this is an atypical infection in the sense you don't see this that often. Here's a 60-year-old with a rapid onset dementia. You'll notice on the T2-weighted scan, it's a little subtle, but bilateral, symmetric on flares well, high signal intensity in the basal ganglia. Uh, there might be a little bit of abnormal signal in the thalamus as well. This is what it looks like on the diffusion-weighted scan. So again, this is an entirely typical appearance of a relatively rare disease. This is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease uh, or mad cow disease. Uh, this is uh, a variation of the theme. You see the asymmetry of the cortex here and here, patient with a similar history. This is a cortical manifestation of CJD. So even though uh, if you have a cursory knowledge of uh, imaging, you know that the thalamus, uh, posterior thalamus particularly, that hockey puck appearance you can see in patients of CJD. I've shown you the bilateral basal ganglia involvement. This is an atypical appearance of, of even uh, rare disease with primarily cortical involvement, but again, uh, should not dissuade you from the diagnosis to see relative sparing of the basal ganglia in CJD. It's a different case, unfortunately, a lot of artifact, but you can still see the restricted diffusion here in the lenniform nucleus. Now, uh, here's a patient post-heart transplant who already we should be thinking about the possibility of opportunist infection with atypical organisms. This patient has bilateral abnormal signal in the periventricular white matter and subcortical white matter, but notice without substantial mass effect. We don't see effacement of the cortical sulci. So we have white matter involvement without mass effect. In this setting, uh, you should be thinking of PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a viral infection that involves the uh, oligodendrocytes with secondary demyelination. Uh, and you can see that these lesions will persist over time, usually progress. Uh, the treatment actually is to improve the patient's immunity. Uh, particularly in HIV patients, you can see this, and really the only treatment is to improve their uh, immunity. Is there's no direct uh, treatment that I'm aware of for the uh, JC virus infection. So keep in mind PML when you see white matter involvement without substantial mass effect, certainly in a, in a population who's not immune compromised, those same features may apply to demyelinating disease, but here you want to think about secondary demyelination from uh, viral infection with, uh, in patients with PML. Now, I'm showing you this because uh, if you read the books, they'll tell you that enhancement is not common. But for whatever reason, in my experience, uh, certainly at Penn, there, we saw a lot of cases of enhancing PML. Here, this was even biopsied uh, to establish the diagnosis because of its atypical features. But uh, I wouldn't allow enhancement, particularly this marginal enhancement uh, that uh, to dissuade you from the diagnosis of PML. So uh, try to sum up here. So look for evidence of infection in the brain, ventricles, and extraaxial space when there is a question of infection. Uh, flare abnormalities can be uh, sensitive but not specific because as I indicated to you, contrast in the extra axial space or subarachnoid space uh, and oxygen effects uh, can uh, influence the appearance of the CSF on flare imaging. And when we're talking about the medial temporal lobe, while herpes encephalitis is kind of at the top of your list when you have appropriate symptoms, you want to also consider some lookalikes which include human herpes virus 6, limbic encephalitis, and the effects of seizures. So usually with laboratory testing, CSF sampling, and uh, history, you should be able to reach a reasonable diagnosis. And I think a reasonable approach is to, when in doubt, uh, particularly when you see medial temporal involvement in the appropriate clinical setting, to treat uh, with antivirals. Uh, and that's uh, all I have to present.
and I'd be happy to take any questions from you. Uh, feel free to offer by chat or to unmute your microphone. Dr. Mamorian. Yes. Thank you for a great lecture. I have a question. Once in Armenia had a herpes and syphilitis PCA proven, PCR proven, and it had it was demonstrating persistent increased the increased flare signal for more than six months in the temporal lobes. Can it be subacute, like flow, flow rate or reinfected, or why I did see that, like persistent? But did the, did the diffusion scan change over time? Diffusion slow, yeah. Diffusion slowed on. Diff, diffusion was positive on the first study, but in mm -hmm. three months follow up, which I was expecting yeah. to be more like, like and like necrotizing like more mm -hmm. like cystigliotic changes. I had some of the same brain matter, hyper intense signal, but without any diffusion restriction. I mean, and I, mean I have to say I have not, un, un, unfortunately, I can't say I've seen a lot of follow-up imaging in these patients. Usually once the diagnosis is made, uh, they tend to uh, sort of make, they might get a long-term follow-up, but they're not sequentially followed. So I don't have a lot of personal experience with that. But I would say that the fact that the diffusion scan improved uh, while the flare scan remained abnormal, I think is just a reflection of that you have an injured brain. And I think, I guess one question in my own mind is what did they look like in a sense a year or so later? And, and did that brain eventually liquefy? So um, yeah, I guess a I, a year I later, A year later, it was already liquefied. But in the, like three, I think it was three to four months follow up from yeah. the first scan, it was like persistently, I didn't see any necrotizing mm -hmm. changes, like any gliotic changes. It was like swollen yeah. brain again, but without diffusion restriction. I have to, I have to think that you're right, that you may have been dealing with like in a sense a partially treated um, uh, case, but um, I'm sure there's variations, but I, 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 I mean, it's an interesting, uh, case, but I, I can't say I know exactly what's going on in that circumstance. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Any other questions and uh, maybe something I can answer? No, well, thanks for joining me today, and I hope you find that helpful in your practice. Yeah, uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, Oh, I see. So here's a question about uh, West Nile and uh, Japanese encephalitis and how to differentiate from NMO. Well, um, NMO is, is primarily, in my understanding, is primarily a disease involving the white matter and usually with uh, spinal cord involvement. So uh, if there's any question, if you do the combination of brain and spine imaging, and of course there's other testing you can do, laboratory testing to make the diagnosis, but that should help you in that differential. In terms of West Nile and Japanese encephalitis, uh, to my knowledge, Japanese encephalitis is associated with a area of restricted diffusion in the splenium. But I think, I think uh, a more difficult question might be differentiating uh, West Nile, which can involve the basal ganglia from uh, ADEM, which can also, that's acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which can also involve the basal ganglia. So uh, honestly, I think in some of these circumstances, the only way to make the diagnosis is with CSF sampling. So, um, uh, and I think the encephalitides can have a variety of appearances, but, but NMO should be one that uh, you should be primarily white matter involvement and should be a combination of uh, spinal cord and brain involvement. Any other questions? Well, again, thanks for joining me. And look, uh, again, if you want to, I'm going to try to post some additional lectures on uh, the YouTube uh, channel, but you can look for that Rad Physics Quarantine University, and, and I hope you find this helpful in your practice.